So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Sesk Writers Guild workshop, uh, Spiritual Writing to Heal Wounds from Your Past, uh, featuring Jen Gardner. Um, a few notes before that. First, I'd like to acknowledge that here in Saskatoon, we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people. I would also like to acknowledge our partners for this program, the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, and uh, Debbie Sunchild-Peterson, who is here. So thank you, Debbie. And uh, to Jen Gardner, who is our presenter for tonight. Um, Jen Gardner is a wife to an incredible husband, mother to three beautiful daughters, or is it four now, Jen? Four. Four, four <laughs> beautiful daughters and a daughter to a merciful and loving God. She is a home educator, writer, and doula. Jennifer enjoys traditionally harvesting off their land at their off-grid cabin in Northern Saskatchewan with her family. Please join me in welcoming Jen Gardner. And as I said I would do, I am going to now uh, spotlight Jen. And Jen, when you start sharing your screen, that will be what is on the screen for all of us. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, thank you, Debbie uh, from, yes, yeah, Saskatchewan Writers Guild and you, Joe, from Saskatoon Public Libraries. I'm really excited and happy to be here and thank you as well for that land acknowledgement. It was lovely. Um, I am going to share my screen and so it's not just my face uh, and hope that, I need to first um, disclose that I am not super tech savvy, so I couldn't quite figure out how to get my notes and to make everything work. So I, I'm gonna be looking sideways a little bit. I might as well just disclose that right off the hop that I'm not, everything isn't uh, right fresh for me. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, just taking time to be with me for this hour. I know everyone's got really busy schedules and I just appreciate you taking the time and I plan to be intentional with your time. I will do my best to get through my presentation in the, the best way that I can in the, the quickest way. And then I wanna leave room after my reading for some discussion. And, and at that time, if you're not really wanting to engage, you're, you're going to be free to go. So that's kind of, and that's the part that won't be recorded. So that's kind of the flow. So welcome to Spiritual Writing to Heal. Um, let's see how to make this work. Is that on full screen? It Do you is. know? Okay. Yeah, it's on full, full screen. Is it? Okay, that doesn't look like it from my end. Let me see. See, this is my not tech savvy. Oh, there we go, okay. So who am I? Joe, you did a wonderful job introducing me. So I don't feel like I have to go into too big of detail, but this is my little family of six squished all together around my lovely Métis Denny husband from Northern Saskatchewan. He's very much outnumbered by girls and loves that. Um, I have three biological daughters and we most recently brought home our, our fourth daughter. And uh, so we are just a nice, fun family of six. And that's actually why I had to postpone the first original date is because that night was when this picture was getting taken, which is our very first family picture as a family of six. That was the day that my daughters met their sister for the first time. So it was a very special day. And it was important that I was just intentional as a, a wife and a mom in that moment. And I couldn't quite find a way to be at both places at once. So, um, Fast forward, we're here and I'm excited to be here. Uh, like Joe had said, I, I am a mom first. I'm a home educator, so we do the whole homeschool thing. I've been doing that since the beginning. I am also a doula, an Indigenous birth support worker. So I work with Indigenous women through birth um, and supporting their families. Uh, as well, I'm an emerging writer, so I don't know who's all in the writing space here but uh that's a big passion of mine and that's something that god has led me to and 
I feel like it's important to share his, what the process he's led me to so that maybe it will help somebody else uh, jump on the same journey if they aren't there yet. Um, I'm also interested to hear other people's processes so we can see what the time allows for. Um, and yeah, I am a daughter to a loving and merciful God. Like uh, Joe said, I'm, I'm a Christian writer and I only write because it was a call and I knew that there was, well, he knew there was some healing in my heart that was needed and that's what brought me into this space. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the process. So we're gonna get into my spiritual writing process um, this is only mine and it's important that everyone finds their own process, but I'm hoping it gives you at least something you can take away and, and, you know, put pen to paper because that, uh, that's the first step. And, um, so I'm going to share with you my process and then we will get into a reading from one of the pieces that I've written and then hopefully have some lovely and fruitful discussion. If you do have any questions, please interrupt me. Um, if you need, uh, I, I won't notice you cause I can't see your faces or anything. So you might have to just unmute yourself. And if it's something that you can wait till the end, then we can for sure visit it during the discussion time. And if I talk too fast, I'm already a very fast talker. And when I'm nervous, that amps up about five times. So just uh, tell me and I will slow down. I will do my best and let's move forward. So this is my four steps to spiritual writing to heal. Um, pray, write, create space. Sorry, my little thing is not. Um, and then I have my letter, but... Um, I also made a step five, but that's basically the repeat. So this is the, the main focus. Um, and I just wanted to touch on that for a second. I think that the first step and is important to note is, is to say yes to the process. Um, the Lord is wanting to heal our hearts and he's wanting to guide this writing process. But I think that it could seem a little bit overwhelming. And I was actually able to find the first piece of writing that I wrote. And so I'm sharing that just before because it's short. Um, it's quite amazing how, how I was feeling in that moment when he first called me in comparison to where I am now. Um, but the first thing I had to do was say yes. I had to be willing to start and to let go of the fear and expectation that I had going in that I myself couldn't handle um, reliving some of, of those things. And so I've now gained a different trust and I just think it's important that I note that to start. So let's get into step one, prayer. So the process that works for me after my yes was to just ask, God to reveal to me what it was that I needed to heal from in the first place. And I know that seems like a very obvious option, <laughs> um, but it's quite amazing what you actually don't know. Um, and so with that, I had just asked, you know, every day I just started a <laughs> simple prayer of just asking, you know what, Lord, if I'm, if I have something that I need to work through some way of healing, please just, I, I start now I'm surrendering this to you and let's go. And, uh, he slowly started walking me through, um, memories, memories that I, some, I had completely forgotten about or had completely squashed from childhood that were revealed to me others that I was familiar with, but the story looked a little bit different and some that were as clear as, as, crystal. Um, and so it was quite, uh, it's, it was been quite an interesting process to just actually, um, surrender that. And so asking the Holy spirit to reveal what it is that you need to heal. Um, journal prompts are helpful as well. I think for some, they're not for everybody, but I think for some to actually just pray on a journal prompt. So if there's a question 
Um, I did create some link to the, to the chapter that I'm sharing tonight, um, but they're quite specific. But I mean, I always, I plan to share more and, and um, there's a lot of resources out there. But even just using a journal prompt and kind of just praying over that first. Um, and then once again, like I said, surrendering the process, um, letting go of control, and then letting go of the fear and expectation of what this healing journey should look like. I think we can be on either end of the spectrum where either we are completely fearful um, of our abilities to handle it. And the other side is just absolutely not even knowing what you're getting into. And so um, trying to stay in the middle, trying to stay in the baseline and just like letting go of, of whatever expectation. Cause here's the thing. If you have expectation that you're going to go to bed tonight and you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to write a little bit and everything is going to feel great. I mean, I think that you're setting yourself up for a little bit of failure there because this isn't our time. And, um, and for me, I had to learn that the hard way that the time of processing that takes um, more time than I, as a human want to let happen, I am a busy mom and I don't have time for this. So I think that um, just, you know, letting go of expectations is, is really helpful. So that's step one. Step two, write. Write without worry. Um, what I mean by this is, if at all possible, don't pay attention to what you're writing. If God reveals something to you on your heart that you need to work through our process, um, just start writing and don't look back. Um, I found that to be a really uh, challenging thing initially, uh, trying to not be editing myself and, and thinking that I need to write for something instead of remembering what I was writing for. And that was just to actually heal. Um, so writing without worry and to write without reading or editing. This is key for me. And like I said, this is my process and I can only speak for that. Um, but for me, most of my writing happens in the middle of the night or in very early morning or very late night. Um, initially, I would think that was maybe crazy and question his will in that. And now I learned that as I've been doing this for so long, that he's calling me to be able to write in the most stillness of my day. And so um, what I would do is always keep paper and my notebook around my bed. And if anything was revealed to me, I would wake up and start writing with a pencil crayon if the pen wasn't working. And I would just write, 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 write and put it away. And I wouldn't look at it. I wouldn't edit it. I wouldn't read it in that moment. I would just write and then put away. And um, always allowing the Holy Spirit to lead my writing. So I wasn't ever thinking through what I was writing, um, trying to make it mine. I, I always try to open my heart to just write whatever comes. And you'll often find if you, if you really do this, you'll find that you write really fast and you don't mean to. That was something that I learned. Also, I learned that if not careful, some of that can be ineligible. But uh, trusting, trusting the process as well. Uh, man, there were so many times that I was like, I need to stop this. This just isn't making sense. And it always worked itself out. And I never was tired. If I was woke up at three in the morning and wrote a chapter and put it away, I woke up that morning and I felt good. I felt free in that for, and it's crazy to think that it was in the middle of the night. Cause I'm, yeah, I'm not a morning person, but, uh, yeah. So right without worry. I'm not following my notes. I guess I should be looking what I'm writing here. Um, creating a safe space. Step three. For me, a safe space was a friend, somebody who wasn't there to walk through some of the trauma in my life, but somebody who I knew could be safe now. Um, 
a safe space could just be a quiet place um, in nature, whatever safe space means to you. But for me, what I found helpful in my process is that I found one person and that person became the person that I could call randomly in the morning and say, hey, I wrote a chapter last night. Um, I'm ready to walk through it. And they would be able to find time to make for me. And we could just have intentional time where I could read my chapter to them for the first time or my, my piece, a chapter, whatever you want to call it. They're chapters for me now because I see it as a book. But before it was just I could read through the memory. And for the first time, I would read it with another person. And as a verbal processor myself, I was hearing these words for the first time almost, even though I had just wrote them the night before. And so I needed to feel like I could process that with somebody. And that might not be for everybody, but for me, that was exactly what I needed. And bless my friend, she was willing to cry through all these moments with me. I, I felt sad for her many times um, <laughs> for doing that, but she always showed up. And, and the thing is, is I needed somebody who I could trust in confidence that I knew that I was, I was always going to be safe with. And, and uh, yeah, and she was that for me. So it was, it was lovely. And she still is that person if I need her. And she had become my safe place. So I read aloud my work, my piece for the very first time. And after I do that, I give myself time to process. Um, that doesn't mean that I have to go on a weekend retreat for every piece that I write or, um, you know, that I needed a specific amount of time. It would, it would be that I would trust that if God called me to taking some time that I was able to do that. And so sometimes it would just be an hour, a visit with a friend and then, you know, just offering it up every day until the next memory came. And, and sometimes it would be just, you know, taking a day to really, um, without having interaction with others so that I could, you know, focus fully on the healing and, uh, yeah. So creating a safe space is, uh, is definitely necessary, especially when you're reading for the first time, because I know this sounds silly that I'm saying to read for the first time, but it's absolutely amazing what I would read and have no clue that I had written. And to attest to that writing without worry piece is that I still have one chapter written in my Hillroy notebook, because that's where all my book is written in, um, that's written in pencil crayon and I can't read it. And I trust that that's because I'm not supposed to yet. And uh, someday I will read it when it's time for me to read it and I will process it at that time. But it goes to show just how little I could actually recall of, of just being willing to, to, to trust and write. So anyways, so creating safe space and the last step, dear hurting me. Um, so I write a letter to myself during that time in my life. Um, so at whatever age the memory came from, I write a letter to that little girl or to that young woman or to the me yesterday, if it was a recent thing, but I always take time to intentionally write to that person, even though it's me, it's quite amazing. The advice that you can give yourself when you look back after a healing moment like that, um, and even though you're the one giving the advice, it's absolutely beautiful how you're able to receive it and it's very healing. So it's something that I very much recommend is to, um, what advice would you give yourself then? And, uh, the other recommendation is if there was somebody or, or people involved in that moment for you, um, like, what would you say to them? And so I've written a lot of letters to people that are involved in some of those moments in my life and not necessarily letters that they will ever read, but they're, they're letters that are written for them. And you can do whatever, whatever it is you need to do to, to make that process, um, part of your journey. So um, some people would maybe burn their letters. Uh, maybe you would throw them in the mail and mail them to a random address. I don't know what it is for you. Uh, for some of the people, 
it is, um, it's a phone call. It's reading it out loud. It's meeting for coffee and, and, and reading them aloud the, the letter that you wrote them. Um, and I wanted to give a quick example of that because I think it's really important to just show you how, for myself, how healing this has been, um, this process has been in writing the letters. I, um, I wrote one of my pieces that I wrote was from when I was about 19 years old and I was sexually assaulted and my cousin was with me. It was my birthday. She was with me that day and, and that night. And she, she wasn't obviously there when this thing happened to me, but she was present. And, um, when I, this chapter came to me, I was very convicted that I needed to read it to her. I need to talk to her. Um, but we had kind of drifted apart and we, we hadn't been that close in our lives at that time. And so we, uh, I kind of just offered that up and I, you know, I, I read it with my safe person and, and I went through the process, my whole writing process I did. And then I just kept praying on that. And I felt that I was really convicted to, to just call this person and, and read this chapter and read her the letter. And I did. And she's a hardworking um, nurse. She's phenomenal. And she's just such a, ser has such a serving heart. And she just got off of like a 14 hour shift. And when I called her, she was surprised to see my number because I hadn't called in so long. And she, so she picked it up to see everything was okay. And she said, you know, I'm in the bath, but um, is it okay if you talk to me while I'm in here? And I said, yes, for sure. So I read her the chapter. I asked her if I could, um, you know, got permission, read her the chapter, and then I read her the letter for her. And as we weeped together and we worked through some of that, she had the opportunity to explain to me that she had been carrying such a heavy weight all of these years. Um feeling responsibility, feeling guilt, feeling all of these things. And, and every time she would try to build herself up to coming and talking to me about it, she would stop herself because she didn't want to rehash it for me. She didn't want to hurt me. Um, she thought that I was safer without the conversation. And little did she know that I was literally trying to, to heal from that moment, right? And so it ended up being a beautiful conversation and a, a restoration of relationship and we're a lot closer again now. And I think that that blockade was really, um, it was really a big um, barrier for us to keep and to build the relationship that we are now able to have today. So um, it's powerful. It's powerful if you trust it. This is, this is a powerful process. Um, I added a step five, but it's not really a step. I just wanted to say it. Um, gratitude and repeat after you finish steps one to four, take time and just appreciate the Lord's healing. If he's bringing you to this healing, I mean, we need to be thankful. And that's a big part for me is to have a grateful heart always. And to know that even if it feels a little bit rough, that I'm just so grateful for the ability to do this and then take as much time as you need to prepare your heart to start over again. Here's the thing about that. He knows your heart. So he knows when the right time is for you. Do not put a timeline on this because you will be so disappointed. Um, trust that um, you will, you'll know, and you might go only weeks and you have a new memory ready. Cause I pray the same prayer always, but it's his timing. Um, you might go weeks and you might go months and you might go a year and really question, but now that I can look back and see that process, I can see why that looked like that. And um, I can see that he knew my heart and he not only knew the time it would take my heart to really truly heal in certain moments, but he also knew the seasons of my life. And that in some seasons, it might've been too heavy to carry. Um, both things and to work through some big feelings while we're, uh, while we're, you know, walking through different seasons. So I'm very grateful looking back that I didn't put a time frame on things because every time that I tried, and I'm sure my friend would be able to attest for that. Every time I tried to push because I was like on a roll and things seemed good in my writing. And then I would realize that the barrier, the only barrier that was there was me and my expectation instead of just trusting a process. So, um, yeah. So going from there, 
um, we are going to get into uh, a reading. And um, I'm going to totally hold myself together. I am also, this is my first public reading of my work. So please bear with me and be patient with me. And let's look. Oh, yes. I wanted to just fully disclose this chapter that I'm going, well, the first piece that I'm going to read for you is the very first piece that I wrote about this journey. And I will hope that it shows, it's just really, it's quite short, but I hope that it shows you where I was at because I was a little bit um, fearful going in and, um, and I, I hope that this is, helps shed light on how all of those spirits were really kind of silly now that I see what's been done for me. Um, and then the second piece that I want to read for you is um, a chapter that I have permission to read about my mother and a part of her story in well, my story that involves her. It's a very vulnerable piece and I'm just so grateful that she was willing to allow me to share uh, when I first wrote it, I was fully certain that she would ever be the only one to ever hear it. And she actually fought that for quite some time because I think she wrote, she thought I wrote that she was a crazy monster or something. So um, I finally kind of cornered her one night around a fire and was like, I really need to do this. This is part of my journey. And, uh, and the first words that she said to me was, you need to publish that. And, and I hope that you're able to help people. So I'm just so grateful for her and our relationship has been fully restored since starting this process. And so I'm very grateful. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> As an adult, a mother, a wife, how do I move forward when so many factors from my past pull me back? I strive to be the wife my husband deserves. He's such a gentle soul and has sacrificed so much for my happiness. How can I be so hard to reciprocate the untrying love he delivers? Why is it so challenging to give myself to him, to love him, some days even to like him? If only I had understood that so many moments from my past could directly affect every aspect of my life, of my future, just maybe I would have worked harder to heal the broken pieces that I have glued together for all these years. And then maybe today the simplest tasks at hand would be so challenging. Pride is an incredible thing. It can be the poison that sucks your last breath from you. It can fuel the edges of anxiety that forms the tremble in your fingers. You see, I'm too proud, too proud to travel back down memory lane, to search out the huge blocks from which I buried all those years ago. I block them for a reason. Life is way easier when you just lock them away in that dark corner of your mind, the corner that only is seen in a nightmare. When you wake up in the middle of the night with tears streaming down your face and your body tense and shaky. You reassure yourself it was just a dream and try to fall back asleep. You wonder why it's so hard to get that dream out of your head, but you can't. You see, it's not a dream, it is you. It's your memories trying to escape. It's your soul trying to heal. But the longer we bury them and forget them, the longer we can live in this disguise of true happiness. When you look through the glass at me, you see a wife who loves her husband and works hard at home to provide. You see a mother that loves her children and would do anything to make sure that they never hurt the way that she did. You see a woman with friends who has coffee dates, play dates, and girls' nights out. You see a friend, someone who wants to support everyone around her, even if it means putting herself out. You watch me go to church on Sundays. You watch me search for a stronger faith in my incredible Lord. When you turn that glass around and you see the mirror that I'm looking into, I want to tell you what I see. I see a lost soul, a powerless woman who is weak, a woman who is scared to open the door of her past because she's scared that she can't handle what's inside. I see a slut, an undeserving bride, a horrifying daughter and a poor friend. I see a girl that would rather grab the bottle when things get tough than to feel the pain from within. The mirror I'm looking into is my reality. The glass that you see me through, that is my mask. The disguise that I wear so perfectly to hide the hurting little girl inside. I know one thing for sure. I have an amazing and loving and forgiving God. I know in him, I will get to the other side and see the same woman that you see. My reflection is just that, a reflection and it can forever change. 
I'm writing this for all other women and children and men who have feared opening the door to their past or the ones who are going through these experiences now. I want to shed light on the importance of healing your soul, that it is never too late to heal. So come along with me as I journey through my own healing, step by step and piece by piece. I'm not a healed being right now, but every day as I write and journey, I feel closer. And I know one day I will be, and I pray that you will be too. So that was the first piece that I had wrote on my start in this journey. <laughs> and uh, I feel safe to say that I do not identify in those lies <laughs> and in the experiences that happened to me. I feel safe to say that I now identify in my truth and what I've seen in myself in this healing. So this is a chapter about my mom and it's called A Rock in a Hard Place. She got pregnant in high school with her high school sweetheart. Everything moved quickly as the option to abort wasn't even an option with her family. They both came from strong Catholic backgrounds and had parents that believed in marriage, pregnancy, and the little being inside of her being a child. Thank God for those strong faith builders I call my grandparents as they are the huge part of me being here. She was scared, but they did what they were supposed to. She had me in May, graduated in June, and married my dad in October. I was baptized as the bastard child, and for confession, that same priest made my father do penance for hours for premarital sex. It's priests like this that give a bad name for our faith. They were a young couple, now married, trying to make a go at this. I lived with my grandparents while they moved to find a home and security. My grandma shares the story with me of the day that she had to drop me off with my parents. She said that she had me in the clothes basket on the passenger seat, and the entire time she thought about turning around and just keeping me. She did the right thing, though. She took me to my parents, and we started our journey as a family. My parents had three more children, and we lived the average life. The busy, overworked parents, the way too many sports and activities for our working parents to keep up with. My dad worked hard and was away a lot in our, our younger years. And mom used to drag us to his hockey games and ball tournaments because it was the only time that we really got to spend with him. She carried a lot. And as we got older, she started to work. Her work days got longer and she was away a lot herself. And this was the beginning of my resentment journey towards my mother. I was 11 years old when I started taking care of the kids, making meals. I was too immature to understand how to care for little kids. And I always took it out on them. My annoyance towards them got stronger and my anger towards my mother was evident. I was young, selfish, and thought I knew everything. If I only could have imagined how hard I made her mothering journey, wow, I would have made different choices. I didn't listen, I didn't respect her, and I often used the tool of putting mom and dad against each other so that their focus would be on fighting each other and less on me. This usually led to me getting my way. They started fighting more and more as I got older, and I remember her crying more and not as happy as she once was. She used to put all of her efforts into committees, sports, her work. She distracted herself so well from the reality of truly being unhappy. There were many times when my brother was young that he would come and stay with me in my room. I felt this obligation to protect him from the fighting, from the unhappiness. They both got married out of loyalty to one another and trying to do the right thing instead of marrying for compatibility and love. I thought many times as I grew up how marriage was not a fun thing and that when I did it, I would have to do it right. Like I would have to prove something. I remember when I moved out at 18, I was finally free of the prison that felt like my life. I didn't understand back then the pain and the hurt that I was leaving behind. I could only think of my future. Looking back now, I can see a quality that my mother passed down to me, a quality that not everyone holds, and it is both a blessing and a curse, but mostly a blessing. My mom was a rock. She had the ability to mask her pain, her hurt, and console anyone around her. She spent her life building others up while inside she was breaking. She put so much effort into fixing problems and carrying friends and family all while her life was crumbling around her. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder as a young adult and something for which I was diagnosed with years later. It's funny when you get a diagnosis like this. 
In a way, it's a breath of fresh air. Finally, understanding some of the ways that you feel and why you may have reacted or hurt that way. But it's also a slow leak in your faith and ability to feel normal again. You see, if you never understand mental illness and just deal with the life that you're given, it is easy to feel overwhelmed and to feel like giving up. With a diagnosis, it's kind of like a punch in the face. Although you now understand you can reach out for support, part of your dignity and your pride and your ability to feel whole disappears. It's hard to get that back. Although my mom was getting all the help she needed, the medication changed, the emotional abuse from us. I know the rapids were coming on stronger and I know she was always swimming upstream. I was living in Regina at this time, preparing to get married. I went through a period of time where some would say it was cold feet. I was overwhelmed with the feeling of marriage, the fear of failing, the fear of having the same life my mom and dad did. I remember getting the call. I still don't remember who called me or what I was doing at the time. All I do remember is packing up a bag and planning to move home. It was one of the scariest calls I had received. My sister had found my mom. She had overdosed using yellowtail wine to wash down the pills, she couldn't handle the pressure of her upstream battle anymore. How was I so oblivious to what was going on at home to know that this was coming? How could she be so low? How could she ever wanna leave us? I remember feeling a lot of emotions on our drive back home to see her, anger that she would think her life was that bad, selfishness to wonder how she ever would want to do that before my wedding day and so close to my birthday sadness for my siblings. All I could think about was my sisters and brothers still living at home, how scared they must have felt. You see, I figured my mom's life would have been easier without me at home. I was always the child who gave her the most stress and trouble. Confusion was a huge emotion that I am not certain has ever really left. So many questions and so little answers. I always knew she was struggling, drowning, but I never knew how much. After a talk with my dad, who became somewhat of a ghost after this, I decided to be the one to move home to take care of her. We had to hide the sharp objects and watch her day and night as if she was a child. How degrading and hurtful that must have been for her, to have her child watching her like a child. I remember her going to the washroom and I would sit outside the door listening to her, scared she snuck something in there. We never really talked about her incident. She told us all that she didn't do it on purpose and she didn't want to leave us. And I wished so much with everything in my heart that I would have believed her. But how do you trust your mother after she tries to leave you? I can never fully understand what that must have done to her, to her self-worth, her ability to lead, to feel human. She survived though. And after time, she started to wear her mask better. And we all started to believe that she was okay I was married a few months later and my family came together like we were the perfect family. My dad and mom walked me down the aisle. Nobody would have ever guessed how broken we all were inside, nobody. In all honesty, I think we even fooled ourselves. It was a year later and my husband and I bought a home only 20 minutes away from both our families. I needed to be closer. I always had the fear of being away after that. My sister lived with me as my husband worked away and I couldn't be alone. She was working a shift at the local bar when my phone rang. It was my baby sister. Jen, she did it again. It's so bad. I don't know if she will make it this time. I jumped into my vehicle and drove to pick up my sister. We met them on the highway and jumped into their vehicle. My dad drove fast, faster than I had ever seen. He cried. He didn't say a lot. He kept looking in the rear view, looking not at who was behind him, he was looking at his wife, whom was barely hanging on. The ambulance told him to keep driving and not to stop because we didn't have time. She was in and out of consciousness and my sister kept screaming at her to wake up, to breathe. I remember telling her how much I loved her, how I didn't want her to go. She would mumble words every once in a while and she asked us to let her go. She didn't wanna hurt us anymore. And in that moment, I remember hating her and loving her all so equally realizing that she was not trying to leave us. She was trying to make us happier. She was feeling that she was that much of a burden in our lives that we would be better without her. Wow, to know that someone could hurt this much, 
to carry that heavy of a cross. I wished I could have pressed pause that day, just stopped everything from racing so fast to hold my sisters a little bit longer so they didn't hurt so bad. I didn't want them hurting. I wish I could have read my dad's mind, understood what he was feeling every time he looked back there at her swollen face, hearing her mumbled words. I wanted to take his pain away too. That rock quality I was telling you about, this is when it kicked in more for me. When I felt like my feelings didn't matter, I was the older sister. I needed to hold myself together and I needed to hold up my siblings and remind them that she didn't mean it. I remember thinking that the more I could convince them that this was another accident, the more I could feel better about it. She was admitted a lot longer this time. She had to have her meds stabilized and a lot of counseling, but she did come home. She put her mask right back on and lived her life like nothing had happened. I know that she knows the hurt that her actions caused, but I don't think that we truly understand the hurt that she was feeling that caused those actions in the first place. A lot of people who go through this experience don't get to live through it. They succeed. They are so hurt and so lost inside that they actually believe they are doing others a favor. Suffering with depression myself, I know that at times things can get really dark and you can feel completely alone in a life full of love. I thank God daily that he gave my mom not one, but two more chances to be here, to watch her children grow, to watch her grandchildren grow. My life would not be what it is today without my rock. A rock is strong, sturdy, and unbreakable most of the time, but even a rock at the bottom of a river will wear down until there is nothing left. I always look at my mother as a diamond in the dust. With a lot of pressure and wear, the roughest of rocks can be the most beautiful stone. Her pressures were hard, hard for her to carry at times, but she has been chiseled into the most beautiful woman that my daughters get to call their grandma. Dear hurting me, sweet child, as you navigate this world as a young adult who has been asked to adult far too young, Find the child within yourself. I know you are angry with her, but know that she doesn't want to leave you. She loves you so much. Sometimes life gets heavy, and when you are a mother yourself, you will have days that feel the heaviness. Stay strong. Lean into supports. Build community and know that you are not alone. In moments that it was heavy for your mom, she felt isolated and alone. Know that with God, you are never alone. Stop parenting your siblings. They don't need a mom in you. They need a sister. Your little sisters and brother just truly need someone to walk with them during this hard time. You are not responsible for taking care of everyone else. Heal your heart and know your mama loves you. When you empty your cup trying to fill everyone else's, you will run out of water for all of you. So take time to fill your cup. Lastly, you are going to love watching your mom with your baby someday, and you are going to see that deep down, she feels for you, that you feel oh, deep down the love she feels for you, that you feel isn't there when you see her look at your daughters. The end. <laughs> so for this piece of my writing, I had thought of a few journal prompts um, that could be helpful to take to prayer. Uh, what is the last serious thing that you talked about with your mother? How did that conversation go? Would you change the way that it went if you could and how? Is there something that you want to talk to her about but are worried that you could hurt her? If you could talk to her right now without hurting feelings, what would you say? And what would you write to her if you could? Dear mom. And like I had mentioned, this is specific to this piece of my writing, but I think that you could fill in the blanks with almost anybody. So maybe just taking to prayer if you have somebody particularly that you need to, um, ask these same questions about. Um, and, and just, 
I don't know what we're at like for time or anything. I'm so sorry if you guys chatted with me and I didn't see it. That's okay, Jen. Uh, so it's 7.50. Okay. Um, okay, so where I think I'd like to take us from here is I just, I literally have, I, I don't know how to get to my full screen. I literally just had planned for like um, a discussion at this point. If anybody had any questions um, or even just anything that they would like to share, I'm always open to learning and growing. Um, and I also just wanted to say that if you weren't interested in that part, that you also can feel free to not feel like you have to stay. Um, because that's kind of, um, it can be, you know, that's vulnerable stuff. And so if you, if you're, you're done, you're welcome to leave. But I just want to thank you again for taking time to be here with me, um, for allowing me the ability to share. And, um, and I just want you to know that wherever you are in your journey, no matter what, if you're here, I am praying for you and I am praying for your journey. And so please reach out to me if there's anything that I can help you with. Um, my website is not up and running yet. Um, with the transition with my daughter coming home, that kind of put a lot of things on the back burner. I had really hoped to have it up before I came to this presentation, but it will be up soon and I'll have some blog posts, um, some resources. I'm in the process of publishing my children's book right now. And so that stuff will be up there as well. I have a, a children's book that we uh, wrote. It's a true story for my daughters in regards to um, grief and loss. It's called Bannock in Heaven. So that will be on there as well. Um, I actually just got to present it for the first time yesterday to the school division. So that was a lot of fun. And, and uh, I just hope to have a lot of resources in regards to spiritual writing available. So that's my goal. I will keep you all in my prayers and I would love it if anybody has any comments or questions that they'd love to uh, talk about that we can just open it up now. And if you are not wanting to stay for that, you are welcome to leave. And before you, uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, so thank you, Jen, for uh, sharing your writing process and your journey and your life experience with us.